Hello students, welcome to the EPG Patshala. I am Dr. Zina Tikbal from Department of Pharmaceutics, Faculty of Pharmacy, Jamia Hamdard. Today I am going to talk about the module Ocular Drug Delivery Systems Part 1 from the paper Novel Drug Delivery Systems 1. At the end of this module, we should be able to understand what is an overview or the general view of the ocular drug delivery, its approaches. We will also be able to understand the anatomy of the eye. We will also deliberate upon the physiological barriers to the ocular absorption. Then we will also talk about the existing conventional ocular systems. Then we will have an important section devoted to the role of polymers in ocular drug delivery. And towards the end, we will have some special interesting points regarding the mucoadhesives which are used in the ocular drug delivery. When we talk of the ophthalmic diseases, they are something which are very, very common in all age groups. The ocular diseases are usually treated by two approaches. The first one is the systemic and the second one is the topical route. The topical route definitely becomes a very, very favorable route because of the easy accessibility of the eye as a drug delivery site. The ocular delivery as such is a very challenging field for the pharmaceutical scientists due to the anatomical and physiological barriers which are offered by this particular site of the eye. The physiological and the anatomical barriers of the eyes which we will discuss in details, they usually present big huge problems for the development of the formulations for various ophthalmic therapies. In continuation, if we think and talk like a formulation scientist, an ideal ocular drug delivery system must be able to be non-irritant and it should be able to be retained in the eye for the longer duration of time. Majority of the topically applied drugs are immediately diluted in the tear film and excess fluid spills over the lid margin and the remainder is rapidly drained into the nasolacrimal duct. This probably remains a major drug delivery challenge. The ocular bioavailability as such is very low with low topical administration and of course this becomes a major shortfall of this particular drug delivery system. Before we get into the nuances of the ocular drug delivery systems, its formulation, designing etc., let us try to understand the anatomy of the eye. The structure of an eye can be divided into anterior segment and posterior segment. Anterior segment primarily occupies around one third of the eye and it comprises of the cornea. The cornea is transparent collagenous structure. It is devoid of blood vessels and receives nutrients and oxygen from aqueous humor and tear fill. It measures approximately 12 millimeters in diameter and it is around 520 micrometers thick. A cornea is transparent to visible light and functions to focus the light on the retina. It is composed primarily of six layers, namely epithelium, Bowman's membrane, stroma, Dua's layer, decimates membrane and endothelium. The second part is the conjunctiva. This is a thin translucent, highly vascularized mucous layer lining the inner surface of the eyelids, anterior surface of the sclera up till the limbus. It helps in hydrating the eye by releasing the mucus and helps in the tear film addition. The diagram in front of you primarily highlights these areas present in the human eye. The iris is the most interior portion of the uveal tract and consists of pigmented epithelial cells and circular muscles. The iris sphincter and dilator muscles function to regulate the pupil size, thus regulating the entry of light into the eye. Ciliary body is another important eye structure part. This is a ring-shaped muscle attached to iris 
produced by ciliary muscles and ciliary processes. The aqueous humor is a fluid present in the anterior segment secreted by ciliary processes into the posterior segment at a rate of 2 to 2.5 microliters. It supplies nutrition and oxygen to lens and cornea and maintains the intraocular pressure. Lens is a crystalline and flexible structure enclosed in a capsule and serves to protect the retina from the UV radiations. The diseases which primarily are because of the anterior segment maladies include glaucoma, allergic conjunctivitis, anterior uveitis and cataract. Posterior segment consists of the back two-thirds of the eye and comprises primarily of vitreous humor, retina, choroid and sclera. Taking one by one, the vitreous humor is a jelly-like substance between the retina and lens. It is composed of hyaluronic acid and proteoglycanes along with some collagen fibrils. Retina is a multi-layered sensory light sensitive tissue that lines the back of the eye. The retina is organized into a neural layer in the middle, pigmented epithelium and millions of photoreceptors. The photoreceptors are responsible for capturing and conversion of light into electric impulses which in turn are transferred by optic nerve to the brain where images are formed. Choroid is a highly vascularized tissue located between retina and sclera and acts majorly to provide nourishment to the photoreceptor cells in the retina. Sclera is the whitish layer surrounding the globe of the eye, also called as white of eye. It is composed primarily of mucopolysaccharides, collagen bundles and elastic fibers. Sclera serves to protect the intraocular contents. The anterior and posterior segment of eye is affected by various vision-threatening diseases. The diseases which affect the anterior segment include the glaucoma, allergic conjunctivitis, anterior uveitis, and cataract. Whereas diseases which associate themselves with posterior segment include the age-related macular degenerations, normally acronymed as the AMD and the diabetic retinopathy. Ocular absorption could be understood in two different manners. We can have either the corneal absorption and we can have non-corneal absorption. The salient features of each of these are highlighted right in front of you. The corneal absorption if we talk about, it depends upon the physico-chemical properties of the drug. It can only be related to drugs which are small, ionic and lipophilic molecules. And the outer epithelium usually becomes the rate-limiting barrier for such type of absorption. The transcellular transport, the transport between the corneal epithelium and stroma is affected. This is a typical pathway which is taken up by the drugs like pilocarpi. On the other hand, when we talk of the non-corneal absorption, it is usually defined as a penetration across clera and conjunctiva into the intraocular tissues. It is usually non-productive because the penetrated drug is absorbed by the general circulation. It is usually a minor pathway for absorption and it is important for drug which primarily has got inherently low corneal permeability. A typical example of such absorption is inulin. Students, in front of you, you have got a schema for the general pathway for ocular absorption. What you can see is that if we talk about the drug in the tear fluid, it can 
go through two basic pathways. One is your ocular absorption, which is only limited to the 5% of the dose. The other is the systemic absorption, which primarily ranges between 50% to 100% of the dose instilled. When we talk of the ocular absorption, it can again be of two variants. We can have the corneal root and we can have the conjunctival and scleral root. The corneal root is primarily the first choice for the drugs which belong to the small lipophilic drugs category, whereas the conjunctival and the scleral root is taken up by the large hydrophilic drugs. The drugs are then submitted to the aqueous humor, which divides the drug into the ocular tissues and resubmits it back to the systemic absorption. If we talk about the systemic absorption, the major routes which are traversed include the conjunctiva of the eyes and so also the nose, while the minor routes comprise of the lacrimal drainage, pharynx, GI tract, skin at the cheek and lids, aqueous humor and the inner ocular tissues. All the drug which traverses through these routes are finally submitted for elimination. My dear students, what we now talk about is something called as the intraocular bioavailability. The more important factors which primarily have an effect on the intraocular bioavailability are number one, solution drainage. This results in the loss of the formulation from the precorneal area by reducing the contact time of the drug with the cornea. Then comes the tears. The tears dilute the remaining amount of the drug in the calde sac, which reduces the transcorneal transport of the drug further. Later on, the tear turnover. In case of around, let us say, 12 to 16 percent in humans, it results in the loss of drug from the eye and so also the nasolacrimal drainage. In majority of the eye drops, these are lost resulting in the absorption of the drug into the systemic circulation through the nasal mucosa. The eye in itself present various anatomical physiological barriers for the ocular absorption of the drug. There are different types of constraints. The primary constraints is the pre-corneal constraints Amongst that, the first one is the scleral barrier. The sclera presents a barrier to the diffusion of macromolecules. Studies have shown a variety of molecules that are able to penetrate the sclera. However, as the molecular weight increases, permeability decreases. In a study using X5 of human sclera, dextrans with molecular weight as large as 150 keda and bevacizumab with as large as 149 keda were shown to penetrate across the scleral layer. Then we have the next barrier that is primarily referred to as the retinal barrier. The retina itself limits the diffusion of macromolecules. Diffusion of drugs with molecular weight more than 76 keda is limited in retina. The inner and the outer plexiform layers provides the highest resistance to the diffusion of macromolecules. Macromolecules larger than 150 keda were prevented at the inner limiting membrane of the retina. The blood retinal barrier separates the neurosensory retina from the systemic circulation. Inner blood retinal barrier is composed of the tight junctions between the endothelium of the retinal vasculature. Fluorescent labeled dextrans of size ranging from 3 to 150 keda when tested for permeation across the inner blood retinal barrier were not detected. The outer blood retinal barrier comprises of the retinal pigment epithelium with tight junctions which pose significant barriers to macromolecules. Anterior barriers or anterior constraints. The first among these is the corneal barrier. The cornea 
consists of an outer epithelium, a middle stroma, and an inner endothelium. Drug molecules that are moderately charged are able to pass through the cornea. The tight junctions, characteristic of the corneal epithelium, limits the passage of hydrophilic drugs. The charged stromal layer limits the passage of hydrophobic molecules and its highly organized nature sieves the larger molecules. Constant flow of a tear film across the outer surface of the cornea limits diffusion and the limited capacity of the lacrimal take results in a low bioavailability of 1 to 7 percent for most drugs and even lower for macromolecules. The conjunctival barrier. Similar to the corneal epithelium, conjunctival epithelium also poses tight junctions that prevent easy penetration of the molecules. However, the intercellular spaces are wider than the cornea, making them more permeable to larger molecules. The subconjunctiva shows the presence of many blood and lymphatic vessels which carries the drug absorbed into the conjunctiva into the systemic circulation. Next is the aqueous humor. The aqueous humor is protected by blood aqueous barrier comprising of endothelial cells in the uvea and non-pigmented epithelial layer of the ciliary body. This barrier allows active and paracellular transport of the drugs controlled by the tight junctions. Fluorescently labeled dextrons as large as 150 keda are able to cross this barrier. The conventional ocular drug delivery systems have till date remain the mainstay for the management and cure of the various ophthalmic diseases. They are very, very widely used for this particular intention. The drugs which are very commonly used in the eye include the antibacterials, myotics, anti-glaucomic agents, surgical adjuncts, and various diagnostics. In a nutshell, if we try to find out that what are the various additives which are used for the ocular formulation per se the conventional system, it would primarily include the different additives with different intentions. For example, we can have intentions like the pH adjustment, tonicity adjustment, stabilization of the active ingredients and solubility enhancement or viscosity adjustments. The conventional ocular dosage forms which primarily are in the market can be of in can be in different formulation designs like we can have aqua solutions, we have them in the form of suspensions, we have them in the form of emulsions and we have them in the oldest form that is of the eye ointments. Amongst the various conventional ocular dosage forms, the one which are the most common are the aqua solutions. These are easy to use, inexpensive and does not impair vision which becomes its biggest strength. The major limitations, however, are their inability to sustain high local concentrations and short contact time within the eye tissue. The contact time can be increased by addition of polymers, examples polyvinyl alcohol and methyl cellulose. These polymers primarily will give the body to the aqueous solution and also help in increasing the retention time. The drainage may also be reduced by punctual occlusion or simple eyelid closure. Then we have the next conventional dosage forms, primarily referred to as the emulsions. The emulsion based formulation improves both solubility and bioavailability of the drugs. The two types of emulsions are oil in water, OW, and water in oil, that is WO emulsions. For ocular inclusions or ocular installations, 
oil in water emulsion is preferred over the water in oil system because the former will cause less irritation and will result in better ocular tolerance. It will improve the residence time, drug corneal permeation, sustain the drug release and therefore enhancing the ocular bioavailability. The various emulsions which are available as marketed formulations include the trade names like Restesize, Refresh Endura and Azacite. The next in line in the group of the conventional dosage forms include the suspensions primarily defined as dispersion of finely divided insoluble drugs in an aqueous solvent along with the suspending and dispersing agent. It retains in the precorneal pocket which improves the contact time and duration of action. The duration of drug action for suspension is primarily based upon the particle size. A typical marketed formulation which comes by the name Tobradex and it, its improved variant Tobradex ST with formulation characteristics, pharmacokinetics, bactericidal characteristics and patient compliance is available for the patient use. Then we have the ointments which primarily are the oldest form of conventional dosage forms targeted for ocular delivery. They primarily comprise of mixture of semi-solid and solid hydrocarbons that has a melting point at physiological ocular temperature of about 34 degrees centigrade. These help to improve ocular bioavailability and sustain the drug release. However, the vision is blurred by the oil base making the ointments impractical for daytime use. These are usually applied for overnight use or if the eye is to be bandaged. They are especially useful for pediatric use since small children often wash out the drugs by crying. These are non-toxic and safe to use on the exterior of the eye. However, ointment bases such as lanolin, petrolatum and vegetable oil are toxic to the interior of the eye causing corneal edema, vascularization, scarring etc. Although there are a large number of conventional drug delivery systems meant for ophthalmic uses. Like we just studied, there are suspensions, emulsions and ointments. But of course, they are having certain big limitations associated with themselves. The first limitation is that despite the best of the efforts, it leads to rapid precorneal elimination. Then probably, secondly, there is a lot of solution drainage because of the effect of the gravity. Frequent installation is necessary which primarily makes it non-patient compliant. Then probably it might result in some amount of conjunctival absorption of the active pharmaceutical ingredient. Of course, many a times sheer irritation, redness of the eye and interference with the vision becomes a huge impediment for particular usage of these conventional dosage forms. Then, Furthermore, the chronic administration sometimes may increase the systemic API availability and which may lead to severe systemic complications. Moreover, formulations with preservatives also induce adverse reactions upon a systemic absorption. Of course, we have got the advantage of the various advanced drug delivery systems. They are advanced because they reduce or overcome the disadvantages of the conventional systems and they offer us something better. What is that better thing which these advanced ocular drug delivery systems offer to us as patients? The first thing is that they give us a absolute sustain and a controlled drug release. Then they also offer site-specific site specific targeting. 
Not only this, they protect the drug from chemical or enzymatic hydrolysis. They also offer to increase the contact time and thus improve the bioavailability or precisely the ocular bioavailability. And of course, all these advantages boil down to one important advantage and that is better patient compliance. The role of polymers in ocular delivery. Retention of drug in the ocular cavity is a major concern of the ocular drug delivery. Thus to increase the contact time and prolong residence of the formulation in the eye, many polymers have been employed such as polyvinyl alcohol, polyvinyl pyrolidone, methyl cellulose, carboxymethyl cellulose, hydroxymethyl cellulose, hydroxypropyl cellulose, etc. These polymers increase the viscosity of the solution and decrease the solution drainage. However, studies have shown that increased viscosity does not have much effect on the amount of drug absorbed. Example, on increasing the viscosity of pilocarpine solution from 1 to 100 centipoids, reduced solution drainage by tenfolds, but amount of the drug in the aqueous humor increased by only a meager twofold times. The ideal viscosity of a formulation should range between 12 to 15 CPS for ocular absorption. Natural polymers like hyaluronate and chondroitin sulfate are also investigated as viscosity enhancing agents. In a study using hyaluronate based pilocarpine solution, significant increase in contact time as well as duration of action was observed. In order to increase the ocular absorption consideration should be given to the lipophilicity of the drug molecule. Drugs with partition coefficient more than 10 show increased drug concentration in the aqueous humor on increasing the solution viscosity from 1 to 90 centipoids. The final outcome or the final role of the polymers would be to have the drug retained in the ocular cavity which primarily is a major concern of any ocular drug delivery. This will then increase the contact time and finally give very positive therapeutic outcomes. Mucoadhesives in ocular drug delivery. Mucoadhesion per se is defined as the adherence of two substances that is a mucosal surface along with a dosage form by means of interfacial forces to enhance adhesion for a considerable period of time. Mucoadhesive ocular drug delivery has gained tremendous importance over a few years. Mucoadhesive polymers form covalent bonds with corneal conjunctival mucin thereby prolonging retention of the dosage form and increasing the residence time of the drug in the eye. Mucin in the eye is secreted by the goblet cells. This mucin forms a thin layer over the conjunctiva and the cornea. Mucin layer forms a part of the tear film which bathes the conjunctiva, cornea and the conjunctival caldi sac. The polymers prolong retention of the delivery system until the mucin turnover is increased which removes the formulation from the mucosal surface. An ideal mucoadhesive polymer for eye should however meet certain criteria such as having an appropriate charge density, presence of polar groups for hydrogen bonding and optimum balance of hydrophilic and lipophilic sections in the polymer. Mucoadhesive polymers like the chitosan, carbomers, hyaluronic acid and cellulosic derivatives are abundantly used for the purpose of getting mucoadhesion behavior. An ideal mucoadhesive polymer for eye should however meet certain criteria such as having an appropriate charge density, presence of 
polar groups for hydrogen bonding and optimum balance of hydrophilic and lipophilic sections in the polymer. Mucoadhesive polymers like the chitosan, carbomers, hyaluronic acid and cellulosic derivatives are abundantly used for the purpose of getting mucoadhesion behavior. Mechanism of mucoadhesion. The mechanism of mucoadhesion per ocular drug delivery systems is similar to any other route of administration. In all the cases, while we are talking of mucoadhesion, we have an inanimate surface in very close intimate contact with the biological surface. The polymer which is chosen and tends to behave in a mucoadhesive manner undergoes swelling in water or aqueous media. Later on, it leads to the entanglement of the polymer chains with the mucin on the epithelial surface. This helps in consolidation of the dosage form onto the biological surface. The unionized carboxylic acid residues on the polymer form the hydrogen bonds with the mucin and helps in proper, close, intimate contact with prolonged retention onto the biological surface. In case of the ocular drug delivery, the polymers which are water swellable yet water insoluble systems are preferred. Commonly used mucoadhesive polymers for ocular delivery. As we have gone through this current module, we could appreciate that the ocular drug delivery systems could be of different physical forms which might include liquids, semi-solids and solid ocular drug delivery systems. There are a variety of polymers which are suited for designing of each of these kinds of ocular drug delivery systems. The mucoadhesive polymers like chitosan, carbomers, hyaluronic acid and cellulose derivatives are used in the liquid ophthalmic dosage forms whereas polyacrylates, polaxomers, cellulose acetylthalate, cellulose derivatives, galan gum, carbopoles are suitably employed for formulation of in-situ gel preparations. Many ophthalmic gels such as Niogel which consists of Timolol and is marketed by the company Novartis and Pilogel which primarily constitutes of pedocarpin hydrochloride have been marketed using these mucoadhesive polymers. Ocular novel delivery systems such as ocular inserts, wafers are formulated using pyolated polyacrylic acids, water-soluble cellulose derivatives and polyvinyl alcohol, polyethylene oxide, vinyl pyrolidone, polyamidoamine dendrimers and polydimethylsiloxane to increase its adherence to the ocular surface. In a clinical study by Bayens, bioadhesive ophthalmic inserts in dogs resulted in the sustained release of the drug from the insert for a prolonged period of time with an added advantage of single application thus improving the patient compliance. Mucoadhesive colloidal systems such as microparticles and nanoparticles are currently being investigated. These particles can be given as liquid drops or in the form of gel. Chitosan is extensively used in many ocular microparticles as well as nanoparticle formulations. On the other hand, polycarboxylic acid carriers such as polyacrylic acid and polyitaconic acids are employed to formulate nanoparticulate hydrogel for sustained release of drugs. Similarly, sulfacetamide sodium bioadhesive microspheres showed increased residence time and enhanced therapeutic activity. Also, microspheres fabricated with mucoadhesive polymers such as pectin, polycarbophil and hydroxypropyl methyl cellulose in different ratios showed significant improvement in male rabbit eyes with keratitis. 
So what we can conclude is that the use of various mucoadhesive polymers will remain a mainstay for designing of most of the novel ocular drug delivery systems. My dear students, in order to summarize this particular module, what we can conclude is that the ocular drug delivery is a very challenging proposition and requires the understanding of the ocular pathway and also the various barriers offered by this route. A pharmaceutical scientist will be able to design a better ocular delivery system by taking into consideration these barriers. Such an optimized system, if ideally non-irritant, non-toxic and biocompatible, will definitely be able to deliver a drug in reduced doses, reduced frequency and with better therapeutic outcomes and more so in diseases which require very large number of installations like glaucoma etc. Thank you so much.